Welcome back to another Real Talk with Clint. Let me just tell you, I'm pretty sure Clint and I could do one of these a day or one a week at least. That guy, when I asked him, what do you want to talk about this time? He said, let's talk about working less. Yes. <laughs> okay, and I love that. So you'll see at the beginning of the video, I asked him, you said that you wanted to talk about working less. And I wanted to know from him, what does that even mean to him? Does that mean just less hours? Does that mean less total number of tasks? And you start to, you know, maybe outsource some of those tasks? What does that even mean to you? Now, not only what does it mean, when did you notice that for yourself and what were your first baby steps that you took? So we dive into all of those types of things. It's a great conversation. Totally grateful that Clint was willing to have this, have another real talk over here at Cultivate Wins. So anyways, let's dive in. You are going to notice two mistakes that were done on this video. Number one, I fumbled when we first started the video. I couldn't even remember what the topic or the title was and it's working less. We get on track about a minute into it and then after that, Goodness gracious, I can't even believe that Chrissy, my creative partner, puts up with me. I forgot to put it on gallery view. So when he talks, it's just him. When it's me, it's just me. And about three minutes in, I got that figured out. So anyways, enjoy the video. It's a great conversation. Thanks, Clint. We totally appreciate it. Take care. All right. So we'll get started here. Clint, we're going to keep this casual. You know that. Um, we've had these conversations before. We probably have plenty of conversations that we don't record as well. So we're all good. <laughs> I, I see this today as one of our normal conversations, just that we're recording it for other people to see. Yep. Now, let's just be fair to everybody is um, those that don't know you and they're just getting to know you. Are you really this boring? Do you really have nothing on your walls at all times? Is this how you live? Uh, I'm a minimalist to the extreme. Uh, I have no desk. I have no chair. No, I'm moving. So this is this is the best I can do for you. You don't get the fancy camera, the fancy lighting, nothing. You get me in my natural state uh, with with nothing behind me because everything is hidden off to the sides. All right. You know, if I'm not having fun, I'm not doing this. So this yeah. is, I just, I couldn't help it. Um, the other thing is, I think it was great that we called each other ahead of time and we uniformed our clothes together so that we actually looked like we were working from the same organization. Yeah. My staff knows that if you're hopping on a web, uh, a webinar or a call or anything, just to wear black. I mean, that's the, that's the safest bet. <laughs> All right, so I had asked you if you were willing to do another conversation with me. This is just another real talk conversation. And w I think you and I, we could do one of these a day and we'd still have things to talk about. So I just point blank asked you, what right now is something that's kind of stirring your soul? What's a topic you enjoy? So I'm gonna read back what you had written to me is, uh, you had said, what exactly, no, I wrote, what exactly does that mean to you? But you said, let's stick to the important things. What was going through your mind when you said that I want to talk about working less and focusing on the important things and making things happen? What the frick were you even thinking when you said that? This is, this is such a, a passionate topic to me uh, because I talk to so many people every single day that are, that are doing what you did, David. They pulled their hair out. You know, they, they're, they're the people that are just working their asses off. And, and they're not truly seeing the fruit of their labors. And I think that a lot of us feel that way, yeah. is that they feel like they're, they're constantly moving, they're constantly going, they, they never have a breath of air, and they're missing out on, on some of the important things in life. Uh, you know, it's sad when I have somebody call me and say, I'm calling you because I worked my entire birthday yesterday, 14 hours, and I had intended to take that day off. And I know I need help. I'm calling you because I just took a vacation and I worked the time I was there. You know, they, they think they're going to hop on for an hour or two. They end up working half a day. To me, that's paying to work. That's working with a view. And ultimately, it, it resonates a lot with me because I used to be that person. I used to be the person that wanted to, to work a lot. I, I got so involved with my work that that became who I was instead of, pouring myself into my work and making that, you know. When you said that's who I was, are you specifically saying that that became part of your identity? Yeah, it did. So yourself me, or to everybody around you or what? I, I think a little bit of both. I think you, okay. you kind of change who you are or, or you, you exude who you think you are supposed to be. Let me ask you, David, 
when was the last time you had a conversation with somebody, somebody maybe you hadn't seen or talked to in a while, and you asked them how they were doing, what they're up to, and their response, their immediate first response was, oh, I've just been so busy lately. Yeah. It's, it's a common, common thing. Yep. And when I talk to somebody, like we just, you know, I just chatted with you the other day. When I chat with you, it's not, you know, what's going on? How are things going? You never say, oh, I've been so busy. You start telling me about all the joys in your life, your yep. family, your, your children, your travels, the, you know, the people you interact with. You tell me about that stuff. You never say I'm busy. People, people talk about being busy like, like it's a sense of accomplishment. Like that's what we're supposed to be. Like other people want us to be busy because that's a good thing. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question and Chrissy, my uh, creative partner is probably gonna kill me if I don't change the view of this. So I'm gonna go to gallery view <laughs> because she can edit it from there. Sorry about that, Chrissy. I probably messed up the first 10 minutes of the video. I don't care. So here's the deal, Clint. Okay, so when you wrote back to me that you wanna talk about working less, my head doesn't just go, okay, we're gonna talk about working less. I'm immediately asking other questions. Okay, are you talking about working less hours? Okay, now here's the other thing that I went into. Some people working less is you need to be honest with yourself and say, are there things that I'm doing that I don't need to be doing that I could be outsourcing? So that's how I work less. Mm -hmm. if, I mean, when you talk about working less, is it one thing that comes to your mind? Is it multiple things? Because when you said working less, I was able to translate that multiple ways in my head immediately. It's definitely working less means multiple things. It doesn't mean go hire somebody to do a bunch of stuff. It doesn't mean get stuff off your plate. It, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah. Uh, to me, it means being productive versus being busy. It means doing the right things. It means, yeah, getting leverage where leverage is needed. And it means narrowing your focus so that you can kind of make things a little bit more streamlined, having systems around things. Okay, so you hit a word that is, um, I don't know if I want to call it a passion word for me because I negatively get passionate about it. <laughs> and that is the word productive. Okay. People want to be productive, but if I was productive and it took me 70 hours to be productive, I'm not impressed with my productivity. Yeah. So when I think of productive, that's not a positive word to me. And the reason why is because it's too open-ended for me. I right. can't, I can't handle the open-endedness of that. So when I, your definition of productive. Yeah. So me productive, I'm usually, if, if I'm coaching someone or I'm talking with someone and they want to talk about being productive, I'm usually going to ask them if it's okay if I change their verbiage or I put their verbiage in check. I want to be efficient and effective. Now, when I think about I'm being productive, it assumes that I'm being effective. Okay? Mm -hmm. I don't care how effective if I am if I'm not also able to do that in an efficient manner. So the right. word productive kind of kind of stirs me in a negative way because when I talk to someone, they don't define what productive means. You and I don't care what you produced. I want to know how long did it take you to produce that? Yeah. When you're productive, you're doing the right things at the right time with the right amount of effort. Yeah. Those yeah. that's being productive because busy is is all about just getting things done. It doesn't matter what the things are. It doesn't matter how many things you're doing. It's just kind of a out of control word for me. That just means you're, you're doing stuff, yep. but productive, right things, right time, right order, you know, right effort. All those things have to kind of be there to be productive. It's the biggest things that are going to move your business, your life, whatever forward in the shortest amount of time. And that's why, I mean, quite frankly, I think we take our language for granted. And so we mm -hmm. use terms that are just quite frankly, they don't have meaning and we don't even, we don't even think hard enough as to all the different contexts that people could put that in. And because of that, they actually almost are, are, are copying out. Okay. I'm being productive. Oh no, no, no. I want to know about your life. Mm -hmm. Just tell me what you've produced. What is that bringing to you in your life? And when I say bringing to you in your life, you know me well enough. Like you just said, when we talk, I might not be talking about how busy I am. I'm talking about the things that have had real life impact on me, such as things with my family and all those other types of things. I want to know if you're being productive. Are you doing that in an efficient manner? Because to me, I want to be around people that can not only be productive, but they can be productive in the smallest amount of time possible. Is we talk about 
hanging out, you become, you know, whoever your top five people are that you hang out with on a regular basis. That's who, that's who you're going to be. I can't even remember how you phrase that. But the fact is, I don't want to be with a bunch of people that are just crazy productive. If they're working 60, 70 and 80 hours a week, that's not the life I want. And that's not who I want to be. Exactly. You're, you're right. People take on the form of language to mean what they want it to mean. It said, y'all may not be on the same page. Yep. My staff knows we've, we've chatted about the, the difference between busy and productive. So busy is, is a four letter word around here. So oftentimes you'll hear the words, oh, I'm, I'm productive. Yeah. Then you start challenging them because they know that that's the word they're supposed to use. And then you start asking them questions and you realize, hmm, no, they're using productive because they don't want to use the word busy. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, we have a lot of friends that just ask great questions and that's, that's why they're my friends. That interests me. I love that they do that. Let's use uh, Margaret Smith, Mo. I mean, Mo just recently posted, have you ever been in a conversation where you never said anything if it didn't come out in the form of a question? You just sat there and just asked people questions. She's all about digging deeper and digging deeper and digging deeper. And I think so often we let people off the hook because they, they will talk about how's their life. Crazy good. Crazy good. I mean, we are producing like we've never produced. We've got more volume than we've ever done. I mean, right now in real estate this past year, we were afraid what was going to happen because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to agents. I'm talking to TC owners. I'm talking to a lot of people in the industry. They had one of their best years ever. Okay. I think that's great, but they're all talking about volume. Yep. I want to ask more questions. Okay. So how did your calendar look this year compared to last year? Is it in relation that your production is better than it's ever been, but you also, did you go from 40 hours to now you're at 60 hours? Did you go from 50 hours to now you're at 70 hours? What did that look like on your actual calendar in your daily life? Not only was the production there, how did that affect your family? How did it affect the time with your family? How did it affect your peace of mind? I want to know about your peace. I want to know about your contentment. I want to know about your gratitude. I want to know about your compassion. I want to know all those types of things. Tell me more. Yeah, people that I love, I love hearing this and, and people do that. They often say, oh, my business doubled from last year. Well, yeah. if your time doubled from 40 hours a week to 80 hours a week, nothing changed. In fact, things probably got worse. Uh, Gary Keller looks, sometimes says that uh, you're losing so slowly that you think you're winning. Yeah. And that's what that is. Yeah. Can you give me a couple examples when you had said, I want to talk about working less? Mm hmm. Okay. Now you had mentioned, I mean, just to be honest, that you had gone through a phase in your life where it wasn't about working less. You might not have even thought about that. You just were working more. Okay. Yeah. Was there a time where it switched where that became an actual intentional thing to work less, or you just became better at what you did and gained some different skills as far as time? Met? I mean, what was that transition like for you? There was, there was definitely an aha moment in my life. And even after the aha moment, it wasn't a, okay, you know, I'm working here, 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 drop down. It was a, okay, let's be more intentional. And it was steps. You know, there's always steps. It, it doesn't just change gradually. Uh, one of the best examples I can give is, is somebody struggling with, with weight loss. You know, you can't just expect the changes to happen overnight. It took you years to get where you're at. It's going to take you there to get the same, you know, to get the results you're looking for. So it was a, it was a time about six years ago, I think, okay. uh, that I started with my last company and I'd been working there for a while. I started going from eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. I don't even think I ever started at eight hours. It's straight up 10, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day. I remember being at the office at 9 PM in the evening. I mean, ridiculous. Why, why am I doing that? Other than beating traffic, there's no reason to be out there that late. So uh, I woke up one morning a few years after I had started working there. And uh, I was dating a girl at the time who had a little chihuahua. And so I opened the back door to let the chihuahua out. And I turn around and I go to get it inside. And I look, and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't run away. It's a little tiny dog. My weeds had grown about that tall, about two feet tall, that I could barely see this little thing kind of piling through. Uh, what a miserable, miserable experience. Like, uh, honey, I shrunk the kids for this poor dog. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of realized, I was like, man, I've completely neglected my, my personal life. And that's when it kind of hit me to go, I'm saying so much yes to work that I didn't realize that my yard was bad. Yeah. What else might not be going the way I intended to in my life? 
because there's a lot of different, you know, you, you wear a lot of different hats in your, in your world. You know, at that point I was, I was boyfriend. I was, you know, I was trying to start it in a new city. I was doing a lot of stuff there. And so I was like, where am I neglecting things and where, where do I intend to be? And that was kind of the eye opener to start saying, okay, how can I start making this better? How can I start having when you ask that question, how could I start making that better? How could I start moving in the right direction? Okay. Did you, was this a self, were you self accountable? Were you self learning all that type of stuff? Or did you find someone to mentor you? I mean, what worked for you? Cause it, I mean, some people don't even know who to go to about that. And so there is some self learning that they're, they're almost forced to. Um, although I, I would disagree and say, reach out to a few people that um, maybe they don't know this, but who do they know that might be the right say, person for them to talk you to? have to start talking to somebody. Yeah, okay. It has to be a conversation with somebody. And yeah. you know, significant other, that's the easy person to have a conversation with. That's not the only conversation to have. Okay. Uh, for me, I actually, spoke to my significant other at the time. And then I, I went and I spoke with my boss and a lot of people uh, don't do this. And it, I think it's a personality trait that a lot of, you know, especially administrative people have a personality that they don't want to speak up. It's kind of a, when it gets to a tipping point, it's kind of a, a lead and leaving fleeing is always the easiest response. You know, it's always the response. I don't think it's the best one. I don't think it's the right one. So I spoke up and I said, Hey, things aren't great. Uh, yeah personally in my life. And I'm noticing this. And I showed him, I even showed him a picture of my weeds and said that uh, you'd be surprised what happens with these types of conversations. You know, the guy paid $200 to have two people come out there and handful every single weed in my yard. It wasn't a big yard. It was expensive. And he did that for me because he said, that's important. And he said, okay, let's start making some motions to help you prevent from getting burnout, from getting work too much. So it was a conversation. Now, he wasn't the only person I spoke to. I spoke to a coworker that knew him before that to, to see how should I approach this. Uh, that was my, you know, that was my form of, of getting coaching, going into the conversation. Yep. You don't want to go into a difficult conversation unprepared. You yep. should role play. You should practice. You should, you should know what you're talking about. You should ask great questions. Yep. Uh, or you should talk to somebody that can ask great questions. When a significant other sees the emotional toll on you, Yep. Their response is going to be an emotional one. Hey, if you're not happy, you should quit. Hey, if you're not happy, you should leave. Those types of things. They, there's always multiple things that you need to kind of consider when it comes to making change. There's an emotional part. There's a logical part. And then there's a, oh, goodness, it's in the book, Switch. There's a third part um, that you need to pay attention to that, that makes for good change. So it was kind of a, a realization that, hey, speak to somebody, speak to another person, speak to the people that need to be spoken to and make plans, make change. Uh, and a lot of people tend to kind of just flee versus work on the issue at hand. And I, I worry that fleeing does not solve the issue within. It's, it makes an external issue, not an internal issue. Uh, and a lot of times I think people get burnt out and they think that fleeing or moving to a new position or starting their own thing is the solution yeah. when they haven't actually identified <laughs> the real problem, which is internal. So the boss you, asking me to do the work never asked me to work 14 hours a day. Yeah. Never. You brought up a number of things. So I want to pull a few of them out. Okay. I mean, I, I could, I could stop this recording now and go back and probably pull out about eight things. But, so let's just pull out a couple things. Number one was, is you had said that your, um, I'll call it a trigger. Your trigger was seeing something physically mm -hmm. and you could see that that was a representation that I've let things get out of control. I've let things get away from me. Okay. Other people, they may hear something and that could be just something. It's a tone in the voice. It's a rolling of the eyes. It's the head going down of their children, asking them to go out and do something with them. And they have to say no again. And maybe up to this point, they haven't been self-aware enough to give credit, give the level of credit to that physical reaction that they're getting from their children for it to have any real impact on them. When that ch child says, no, that's okay, and puts their head down, they, that hasn't impacted them yet like it could. It could be something of the fact that we've had other people where we've talked to them, and quite frankly, they know they've got to make a change. 
because they've had to go to the doctor because they've had, they've, and their doctor has said, you're going to kill yourself. You either need to change careers or you need to change the way that you're doing your career. You need to change your eating habits, you know, everything else like that. So there's a physical sense of it where they're just making themselves sick. Now for me, it was about peace and contentment. That's where my desire for time management came in. And that was because at the time, mental health was a real issue for me at a younger age, and I couldn't find peace and contentment. And all I cared about is what does peace and contentment even mean? What does it look like? Everything. And I started basically studying books. Now, that was one thing Then I moved on because I was afraid to talk to anybody because I had talked to one person. And when I said that, I just I feel like I'm depressed. I feel like I, I don't have peace and contentment. All they could do is, is tell me it was all in my head. And so I had such a negative reaction from the person. It came across very harsh that I never wanted to talk to anybody again. So I went and did personal study. Then I went to classes and then I got coaching on it. David, if, if this was, you know, back then I would have said, yeah, it's all in your head, but that's where you live. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so I just want to mention some of these different triggers for people because there may be someone had a reaction like I had where I tried to go talk to someone and they basically told me that whatever I was saying had no, no sense in reality. Mm-hmm. And, and I felt embarrassed that I'd even gone to talk to them. So of course I didn't want to talk to anybody else after that. Okay. So then I started doing personal studies. Then I started going to actually, because I was afraid to still go one-on-one, I started looking for like group coaching where I could kind of hide in the group and still get some value out of it. Then I started gaining some knowledge and gaining some information about peace and contentment and started really realizing that my calendar could actually be a part of that. And so I started looking at time management and started getting personal coaching on time management those types of things. So I just want to encourage people that your trigger may be something like the grass is too long and I lost my dog. (laughs) I've heard you tell that story before and it still cracks me up. Okay. My grass is too long. I lost my girlfriend's dog. Okay. That's a real story. But there are other people's stories where if they were just more self-aware and they looked at the reactions that they were getting when they were saying no to their family and saying no to their children and whatever else, that that could trigger the start of them wanting and desiring to move in another direction. And it could be that you've talked to someone and you got a reaction that you never want to go talk to anybody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are still don't give up at that point. Don't give up at that point. And it's not that you'll get a response where you're telling somebody no, per se. You know, you know the saying, every time you're saying yes to something, you're saying no to something else. Yep. It, it, it doesn't have to be the words yes and no. It could just be the, the act of doing. So realize that by, by working an hour late at the office, yep. what you're doing is you're saying no to being with your family. You're not saying yes or no in any of those situations, but it's the act of doing. That's, you know, the trade-off. What, it, what are you trading that time for? So realize that it doesn't have to be you saying no to a child or, or no to getting your yard work done. It, it could be just the fact that you're, you're neglecting something else because it's a trade-off that you've made. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. And you may have an answer for this one. You may not have something that you've, that you've used in the past. I'm just kind of curious where you are with this. Is <clears throat> Do you have a way of anything that would actually help you to see whether you're moving in the right direction. Now I do, I have something that I use that helps me kind of monitor whether I'm even moving in the right direction or not. Is there anything for you? You knew you were here. You want to be over here. Is it maybe an accountability partner? Was it journaling? Was it, what was it that you, that you were able to see that you were moving in the right direction or fee feel or confirm? So the, the first, the biggest thing I can think of, David, was specifically related to the hours I was working at the office. Okay. The hours I was you working at a change in that. I wanted to change. Yeah. I made a specific point to make a change. So this, again, this was a year or two after that incident. So this has been a work in progress. Uh, but of course, it, again, it didn't just change overnight. It, it started by changing what I was thinking, what I was doing. Uh, and then eventually it came to the point where, you know, you kind of sometimes you, without the accountability, you go back. So I think you probably heard me tell this one as well. I've got an accountability partner, my accountability partner that I got that time, which was a year or two after that incident was a dog. 
I, I was living on my own at that point. And I had started because of that. I didn't have anything to come home to. So I started working a little bit more, spending later nights at the office and everything. Again, it started creeping back in. So I said, well, if I had a dog, which I do want, if I had a dog, I would be forced to leave on time yep. because I'd have to get home to take care of, of yeah. my dog, which was a great decision. Best accountability partner ever. Um, Amen. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, that, that's what I did to start, you know, that's okay. of course, you, you know, uh, when in doubt, get a dog. That's probably the number one thing that you have to take away from this. You're uh, talking to the right guy. Right. <laughs> and, and squirrel sits at my feet right now. He's <laughs> actually watching this right now, David, just right now, right. Get a dog. Get scratching. a dog. Answer. You know, answer. answer. Get a dog. Yeah. That's All right. I did not plan on doing this. I had zero plan on, on showing this, but it's sitting on the side of my computer. So I'll just show it right now. What's sitting on the side of my computer. Okay. So these are some of the top um, planners and journals in the market today. So when a well-known person puts out a new journal, a new planner or anything, I buy it. And the reason why I buy it is not even because I'm going to use it. I buy it because I believe that they may have some insight that I could learn from. So one of my favorites is the High Performance Planner by Brendan Bouchard. Then you've got the Impact Theory one. Then you've got uh, the Better Life Journal. You've got um, a lot of people have read the book recently, uh, the 12-week year. Okay. So I get these because I like to see how other people track their progress, track their day, everything else like that. So here's what I typically do. Um, and this is just fun for me. I mean, I get geeky on all this kind of stuff. This, I mean, who buys journals just for the fun of buying journals to see how someone else thinks? I mean, that's just kind of like a hobby of mine. So what I do is I don't use a planner like most people do. They use it as, as literally that. It's a planner. It's part of their calendar, everything else like that. Anybody who knows me, I am geeky and in love. Google Calendar is a love language for me. I love my Google Calendar, okay? But my Google Calendar is not my planner. I set goals and my Google Calendar is for me to document how I would reach my goals. But just because it's on my calendar doesn't mean it happens. I could have something set for noon and someone no shows me. Just because something's on my calendar does not mean it actually happened. Now, I also could put something on my calendar and I just don't honor and respect it and I blow through it. Okay. So what I do is my Google calendar is my plan of what I want my reality to be. And if my reality looked like this, I would achieve this. So here's the line I use. My calendar reflects the human being I want to become. So that is for me as a husband. That is for me as a son. That is for me as a father. That is me as a business person. It reflects and it shows the human I want to become. So what is the planner? I actually don't use the planner the way that most people do. And they start, you know, putting in all of their dates and everything. This is actually my activity log of what really happened that day. So I actually use a planner as more of a journal and an activity log. My Google calendar tells me what I plan to do. This tells me what I actually did. And so that's how I use a planner. And what I noticed, if I just use a journal and I have an empty notebook, I look at an empty page and it intimidates me. Mm -hmm. And so I journal for a little while and then I get out of the habit. Here, what I do is I do an activity log slash journal where I log my day. And then on the side, it asks me, what were my wins today? What were my mini wins? What were my gratitudes that day? What were my thoughts? What are my doodles? It actually says doodles on it, okay? So from there, that's how I use a planner. My planner actually becomes my activity log and my journal. Now I'm able to look at, here's the human that I wanted to be today. How does my activity log show that I did in relation to the human I wanted to become? And sometimes skipping a meeting helps me be the person that I wanna become. It's Absolutely. not just making the meeting. I shouldn't have planned that in the first place. I should have planned more time with the family and not work so many hours. So that, if that helps anybody, that's how I use a planner. Because I think of my planner more as my journal and activity log. Yeah. So David, I'm, I know you know the, uh, the 411 and the GPS. These yep. are Keller Williams tools. GPS is used for, for a bigger scope of planning. And the four and ones used for a, a more actionable goals, uh, actionable islands and goal settings. 
So before I was using those as this is a tool for insight for my boss. Okay. I changed my mentality on them because yes. it was, it was, here's the tasks I'm going to be working on. Yep. I that to here's what I'm going to be doing for myself. And this is what's going to move me forward. Uh, I changed, you know, we changed the, the bottom part where you have your weekly yep. action items, not goals. Those are specific action items related to your monthly goals, which are related to your annual goals. Everything yep. has to feed upwards and it all feeds to the biggest category, which is your personal life. Nothing else. doesn't matter what the business goals say. It has to feed into your personal because that's who you are. You are not your business. The business is you. Uh, so, I had it change that mentality. Then yes, everything on the actionable items goes onto the Google calendar. Yeah. And by doing that and actually holding that time block, like, like a religion where it's going to be happening. Yeah. I found that what happens is you take those action items, which 100% equate to your monthly goals yep. and you're setting your monthly goals on autopilot. By determining what actions you need to take to hit your monthly goals, you put that monthly goal on autopilot. So now I know if I'm planning my annual goals that roll down to my monthly goals and preparing weekly action items, by doing those, I have a hundred percent chance of hitting my my goals for the year. Yep. It's not a it's not a wish. It's it's gonna happen. Yep. And if I choose to to change the time on my calendar, I know that what I'm saying no to is that annual goal. And so if I choose to do something with the calendar, if I, if I want to go golfing instead of taking a meeting, you know, if David's trying to call me and I say, nope, I'm not answering that guy. I'm going to spend time over here. Then I know what I'm doing is, is choosing another thing. Yep. So I, I use that to go, okay, does this get replaced? Or did I, did I put something on here that's not for me? Okay. So last question on this is, do you journal? Uh, I don't, I don't actually journal. Okay. Yeah, I know that's, it's a, so I read the, uh, the miracle morning long yeah. time ago. And yeah. what I found by, what, by doing that, David, is, of course, he talks about what is it? Uh, savers, uh, six different things, six different things to do. And so I intended, you know, to go from zero to 60 per se, yep. from reading that book. And so I started trying to do all of them at once. Instead of making incremental changes in my life, you try to go all in. Well, when you don't, when you don't make incremental changes, when you try to go all in on something, it's very difficult to continue if it's not for you. If, and it was the, it has to be for you at that time, at that time in your life. And let's admit, there are some people that are just freaks in nature and they can go all in and stick sure. with it. In there my are. opinion, they're That's freaks cool. of nature. Because I'll just tell you right now, that doesn't work for me to go from zero to 60 overnight. I need to figure out what you had mentioned. What are the baby steps that I could take to incrementally get to where I want to be? And I'm not worried about getting to where I want to be. I want to know that I'm always moving in the direction of mm -hmm. that. Because then I'm no longer being hard on myself in this sense. Okay, if it's all about where I want to get but the whole time getting there, all I'm saying is I'm not there. I'm still not there. I'm still not there. That's that's a negative mindset that does not help me on a day to day basis. Yeah. If I know that I'm taking baby steps and every day I can say I'm moving in the right direction, I'm moving in the right direction. I'd rather keep saying every day I'm moving in the right direction. I'm taking another step. I'm moving in the right direction rather than every day saying I'm not there yet. I'm still not there yet. I'm still not there yet. It's just a different mindset walking into every single day. I'm failing versus no. Today I'm win I'm still winning. Yeah. I'm still winning today. Yeah. It's the it's it's taking a new habit. The best way, by the way, to, for me is to anchor it to an existing habit. But but being gentle with that new habit. You know, if you don't work out and your intention is to go work out an hour every single day. Yeah. And if you look at the clock and go. I'm not sure how many get that hour in because of all the other things I said yes to and get 10 minutes in because 10 minutes is better than the zero you were doing before. And then do 20, then do 30, you know, getting, getting up. It's, it's better than nothing. It's, it's moving to the direction of the habit that you're trying to create. Uh, and David talking about that noon reset, let me ask you, is there anything that's as satisfying as playing hooky? <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> 
So here's, here's, I mean, and anybody can take what we're saying and, and change it up for what's right for you, but you can steal exactly what we're saying too. So here's one I would recommend that you steal. You find someone in your world, in your work organization that will hold you accountable to playing hooky twice a month. Oh, I'll, I'll hold anybody accountable to playing hooky. If I don't know you, reach out to me. I will hold you accountable to playing hooky. It's absolutely amazing. I do it twice a month. And Chrissy, my creative partner, we have it on my calendar that two Wednesdays a month, because my, my wife is available all day, 24 hours, every single Wednesday. So her goal is, is to make sure that I play hooky at least two of those days, um, because she's available every Wednesday. And if I play hooky and I go have a date day instead of a date night with my wife, there's just something, there's just something more special about it. Mm -hmm. And it really is a reset. It's a reset in my marriage. It's a reset in my relationship. It's a reset in my professional life. Because you know what? I could have just worked through the whole day. And getting me away from it, I came back this morning because today's Thursday. So we played hooky yesterday, okay? And we went to the Minnehaha Falls and, and we went out to lunch together. It was beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. And today I came in just a rejuvenated person to work today. What I love is that if you're, take, if you're playing hooky, any shop or restaurant, anything you go to, it's going to be empty. It's, it's wonderful. Empty. It's wonderful. It's Yep. It's the best. It's the best. And I don't know if anybody knew that they would come and watch this video and the end result would be is that we told you and coached you to play hooky. Uh, get a dog and play hooky. 100%. 100% on both of them, baby. Play hooky with your dog. Done. I love it. I love it. Clint, is there anything else? Because I mean, you and I, we've talked about this before we even started. We can go on an hour, two hours, three hours, but let's just keep this short for people. Is there anything else that you want to share? I think there were some fun things that came out of this. Um, and I just want to thank you for your time. You know, I love you. So it's all good. It's a pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I read, I read the greatest quote in a, a book the other day um, that just started reading. Um, and it said, burnout is not a badge of honor. And too many people wear burnout as a badge of honor. It's not, it's truly not. So just remember burnout's not a badge of honor. Uh, you working your, you know, your tail off is yep. not going to really, get you exactly what you're trying to get in life. I'll tell you that there's, there's better ways to do it. Yeah. Boy, that is tough that you ended on that one because just that one statement alone could trigger about another hour long conversation, but we will leave it at that. Clint, adore you, man. I'm glad sure. to have you in my world. And uh, everybody, if there's anything that, that either one of us could do, and I'm speaking for both of us, because I know I've already heard Clint say this at least once on the call today, reach out to us. Give me a break. I'm not saying that you need to be working with us or anything. We're not here to promote our businesses or anything else like that. The fact is, is if this is an area that you are struggling in, it is an area that we are both crazy passionate about. And we are more than happy to take any calls, emails, or texts on this. But uh, Clint, I love you, brother. We'll I talk appreciate to you, you later, David. Right? I'm going I'm to challenge your creative partner to toss our email addresses in right here, right now. <laughs> All right, Chrissy, you heard it. Thank you, Clint. Have an awesome day, everybody. Thanks. Take care.